My name is Francis Sue, and I am a professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd College, which is a small science and engineering school in Southern California, one of the Claremont Colleges. I study mathematical problems that come from the social sciences, and the research that I do is a mix of game theory, which is the study of mathematical models of decision making, and combinatorics, which is a study of clever ways of counting things. And often there's a topological angle, and topology is a study of the mathematics of stretching things. What's great about math, math is amazing. Uh, math is, um, I guess one of the ways I like to think about it is it gives you a new, a powerful lens on the world. So you begin to see hidden structures that underlie the way the world works. You begin to see patterns everywhere. And that gives you a richer, more full view of, of uh, the world around you. So game theory is basically using mathematics to try to understand how people interact with one another. So an example that people often are familiar with is, uh, is uh, John Nash, who studied um, what are called Nash equal, now named after him, Nash equilibria, which basically makes predictions about how people are going to behave in any strategic interaction. And mathematics comes in because mathematics helps people model preferences. So if you think about a parlor game, you, you play a strategy, I play a strategy, and that results in an outcome. And in game theory, we use mathematics to model how, how people uh, value the outcomes that result in some interaction. Combinatorics is, uh, one way you can think of it is the study of clever ways of counting things. So an example would be if I were to ask a question, how many ways are there to get a full house in a deck of cards? That would be a combinatorial question. Or how many combinations are possible in uh, the lottery? That would be a combinatorial question. And so in combinatorics, we come up with clever ways of trying to understand and answer questions like that. And uh, often, they arise in very practical problems. So if I'm studying um, uh, uh, data, it, it would come up very naturally in understanding the ways, the number of ways that certain kinds of uh, phenomena could, could happen. Uh, if I study um, uh, probability, you're often counting the number of ways that certain things can happen. So one way to think about statistics is it's learning to be a good detective with data. And often, to be a good detective, you need to know how to how many ways the certain kinds of events uh, happen. And so that's where combinatorics might come into the study of statistics. Well, I guess one of the things I love about what I do and what I study is that I'm using beautiful, interesting mathematics uh, to actually answer questions that people care about. And often these are questions about how humans interact with one another. So one of the questions that I've studied is, the ma is uh, related to the mathematics of fairness, fair decisions. So I study, for instance, problems that have to do with how you allocate objects fairly between several people. That's an economic question. It's a problem of fair division. And I've also studied problems in voting theory. And so there's lots of interesting math questions that arise when you uh, look at uh, problems that come from the social sciences. And so there's, there's beautiful, a mix of beautiful math and, uh, and, uh, and some fun applications. One of the great things about math that draws me to math is that math is often a very creative endeavor. And I know lots of people don't think of math that way, but uh, what, when people are drawn to math, it's often because they are excited about being creative. And one of the, 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 the big questions in math is, well, is, that you wrestle with, is math created or discovered? And so what's interesting is I might have a, a mathematical idea that, um, uh, that someone else who's separated from me by time or geography or culture might also have the same idea. And so in some sense, math is created, yes, 
but it's also in some sense discovered. Like you could have two people living in two different places come up with the same mathematical idea, which somehow points to the underlying reality that, that we're somehow both accessing. And so as a person of faith, I also see, um, see this as well, right? I, I think it was Kepler who said that um, he felt like he was thinking God's thoughts after him. And so in some sense, when you do mathematics, when you discover or, or uh, a, a mathematical idea, you are thinking God's thoughts after him. Um, if I see that math is beautiful, I now, as a person of faith, begin to understand why math is as beautiful as it is. It reflects something about the character of God. If I believe that math is truthful, uh, again, I see something in there that, that points me to the, uh, the, the God who created it all. And so that, that to me, is a very um, wonderful synergy between math and, and faith. So I think of human flourishing as answering the question, what does it mean to live life well? And uh, people don't often think of mathematics in terms of what does it mean to live life well, but the way I think of mathematics is that math, when people are drawn to do math, they're drawn to it because they see how it connects to some of their deepest human desires, like a desire for truth, or a desire for beauty, or a desire for freedom, or for justice. And uh, mathematics, the way I see it, helps us, helps us achieve some of these deep human desires. And viewing math in this way often helps, helps you flourish, because you build virtues. For instance, you uh, in a search for truth, you develop the, the virtue of persistence, to be seeking after truth. Uh, in a search for beauty, you begin to expect enchantment everywhere you go. And so there are certain virtues that are built by the practice of doing mathematics, and these virtues will serve you well no matter where you go or where your life takes you. Uh, if I'm a more curious person, if I'm a more uh, a persistent person, if I learn to take delight in beauty, uh, if I seek after uh, truth, these are all virtues that will carry over no matter what my profession is. Well, one way that my faith has impacted my work is that it often causes me to ask different questions than I might otherwise ask and be interested and curious in, in uh, questions about how people ought to, so for instance, I study the mathematics of fairness in some sense. And so what does it mean to have a fair solution or a just solution? That's a kind of question that I wouldn't necessarily be as interested in if I wasn't also a person of faith, I, I, I think. Um, and so it, it definitely has affected the choices of questions that I study. Certainly affects the way that I I strive to uh, treat other people, my students, my colleagues. In the other direction, I would say that my work has shaped some of the ways that I think about uh, the, the, the faith questions that I have. So for instance, as a mathematician, I often grapple with um, big ideas about what does it mean for a set to be infinite. Uh, and you know, we often talk in our faith about God's magnitude, God being infinite in some sense. And as a mathematician, I actually have a grasp, a deeper grasp of what it means, you know, how amazing it is to be even able to say or to think about God as being infinite. Because I know all the layers of nuance that the notion of infinite carries. And so I would say that um, being a mathematician has en enhanced many of the, the ways that I think about uh, the, the ideas that arise uh, in my faith journey. So here's a, a cool uh, question you might ask yourself. If I have a deck of cards, how many shuffles does it take to mix a deck of cards? Well, one of the very recent results, by recent I mean in the last uh, 30 years, is the result that it takes seven shuffles to mix a deck of cards. And what's amazing is I can actually pretty easily show you that five shuffles are not enough to mix a deck. And I, 
I'll see if I can do that right now. This probably, this may take too long, but we'll try it anyways. Um, so when you mix a deck of cards with a, with a riffle shuffle, you often take a, de a, a, a deck and you cut it and then you interleave the halves. But the halves may not be the same size and they might interleave in sort of a, 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 you know, a funny way, right? Okay. But one thing you do know about when you shuffle is that after one shuffle, what you end up getting are basically, you know, if the original deck were, were numbered 1 through 52, then the new deck is going to have two sequences in it, this one and this one, that are interleaved in some way. And if I count through the deck in order 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 52, I would need to pass through the deck twice to hit every card in order. So that's a property of a shuffled deck that's been sh uh, shuffled once. Now, if I cut this deck again, then those sequences, are called rising sequences, are going to split again. And I might have what are called four rising sequences. And if I cut the deck again and shuffle, I'll have eight. And so what you learn is after three shuffles, you might have eight rising sequences. After four, you might have 16. After five, you might have 32 rising sequences. But then you can just check that the deck in reverse order actually has 52 rising sequences. So the reversed deck can't be the result of five shuffles. Now I probably didn't tell you all the details in there, but it's kind of amazing that just by using the power of your mind, you can see, if you think about it a little bit, that five shuffles are not enough to reverse a deck, much less make every configuration equally likely. So that's kind of nifty, right? Like it's like, whoa, I didn't even need to actually shuffle any decks for me to have an insight uh, that shows something about um, how cards shuffle. And one of the things you learn when you start studying what it means to be infinite is you realize there's actually different sizes of infinity. So for instance, the numbers, the counting numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., they go on forever. That's an infinite set. But then the real numbers, so if you include numbers with, you know, with decimal expansion, uh, the numbers that come out of your calculator, those are also, there are infinitely many of them. But it turns out that the size of the real numbers and the size of the counting numbers are actually different. And you might think, oh, well, that's just theoretical. It's, you know, what does it have to do with, with um, anything that I could possibly care about? Well, that insight, which is now um, 150 years old, is, uh, is you know, now in the age of computation, it enables us to say some amazing things, right? Like, um, it turns out that the set of all computer programs you could ever write is the same size of infinity as the counting numbers. But the fact that the, the real numbers are a larger size of infinity means that there are some real numbers which can never, whose decimal expansion can never be computed as the output of a computer program. So we learn something about the limits of computation by knowing something about uh, the size of infinite sets. So that's kind of mind-blowing.